Good evening. I'm spot on weather meteorologist Matthew Euler. And tonight we're going to get into video two of the summer weather video training series. And we're going to title this Energy, the Fuel for the Atmosphere. And if you look at the title slide of tonight's training, uh, we look at three main pictures here. We have an image of the sun on the left, the sun being that main energy source for Earth's weather. It really gets things going, heats the Earth's surface, mixes up the air masses, creates what we know as wind. When we feel that wind blow across our faces when we're outside, that's a result of the heating from the sun, creating temperature differences and then ultimately pressure differences. Uh, the middle image there shows a very strong cyclone. And this is known as an extra tropical cyclone, extra meaning outside, outside the tropics. Looks like a swirly cinnamon roll, very strong uh, curled nature to it. And energy is very important in the strengthening of these extra tropical cyclones, as well as hurricanes in the tropics. And then the image on the right shows what a lot of us are very familiar with. And that would be lightning, whether it be lightning that zigzags across the sky horizontally or um, basically works its way down from the cloud to the ground uh, as a cloud to ground, uh, ground lightning strike, or maybe just the flash, the sheet lightning that you see. It looks like a sheet of light. That also is a lot of energy. Bottom line is everything starts with the sun to create the weather. And we're going to really explore the importance of energy, and energy conversions tonight. Hope you enjoy it. So we're first going to start off before we get to the topic on energy. We're going to talk about the actual definition of temperature. And temperature is defined as a measure of the average kinetic energy or average speed of molecules in the air or water. Now kinetic energy, and we'll get to this in a little bit later, if I say the word kinetic, I mean energy of motion. All right. And temperature is basically you know, if you look at the average speed or motion of molecules, how fast those molecules are moving is going to determine the temperature of a substance. So if I have a lot of molecules that are really moving quickly, that's going to result in a much higher temperature of a substance. Whereas if I have molecules that are moving very slowly, that's going to indicate a colder substance. So it's the average speed of those molecules or the average kinetic energy that determines the temperature of a substance. And it is the most important weather element. When we start talking about temperature, we need to also talk about temperature scales. All right, so Anders Celsius in 1742 came up with this scale that's named after him, the Celsius scale. And he determined that zero was equal to the freezing point of water and 100 degrees on his Celsius scale was the boiling point of water. And for the most part, Celsius, we don't use it a lot in the United States. We do use it in the meteorology field on upper air charts, uh, upper air maps, uh, you know, 5,000 feet, 10,000 feet, 18,000 feet, 30,000 feet. We use degrees Celsius for the upper air weather maps, but at the surface, what we're most familiar with on the, as far as temperature scales in the United States, is the Fahrenheit scale. The rest of the world uses Celsius. Um, so if you have a relative over in Europe, or if you yourself and family ever went on a vacation to Europe, and you hear somebody say, it's 30 degrees today, it's hot. To us, we would be thinking, that's freezing. That's a wintertime freezing temperature, 30. But to the Europeans, they use Celsius as their primary temperature. So if you go over there and hear a TV weather person uh, say, hey, it's going to be 30 degrees Celsius, you know that's very warm. In fact, that's 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So now we're going to jump into not only introduction on these scales, we're starting with Celsius. I'm also going to talk to you briefly about Fahrenheit temperature scale as well as Kelvin. All right, so with the Celsius temperature, how do we convert that Celsius temperature to Fahrenheit? So again, if you were over in Europe on vacation, and let's say the temperature, the high temperature for the day is 20 degrees. You hear the TV weather person say, hey, it's 20 degrees Celsius today. How would you convert that to Fahrenheit to something like we're more familiar with in the United States? Well, the first thing you would do is you would take 
you multiply the Celsius temperature, whatever that be, by 1.8. And then you would add 32 degrees to whatever that value was. So let's do a practice problem real quick. Um, example, convert 20 degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit. So what would you do in this case? Step one, you'd get your temperature, you'd have your whatever the temperature is in Celsius. Step two, you would take that, for this example, 20 degrees Celsius times 1.8, which is equal to 36. And then you would add 32 degrees to that to get 68, equaling a temperature of 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So just keep this in mind. This is how you would go convert from a Celsius temperature to a Fahrenheit temperature. Now, Gabriel Fahrenheit came up with his own temperature scale, and it, is, it ranges on his scale between freezing and boiling point of water. There is 180 equal divisions. 32 degrees Fahrenheit on his scale indicates freezing point of water, whereas 212 Fahrenheit is equal to the boiling point of water. And, of course, we're very familiar with the Fahrenheit temperature scale here in the United States. Uh, we listen to the weather reports on the news, or if we're looking at the local weather service forecast, um, or whatever your weather source is, you see the degrees in Fahrenheit for the temperatures, and you're very familiar with how to dress based on those temperatures each day. How do we convert Fahrenheit to Celsius? So now we're going to work the other way. We're going to go, if I give you a temperature in degrees Fahrenheit, how do I know what it is in Celsius? Well, what you're going to do is you're going to subtract 32 degrees from the Fahrenheit temperature you're given, and then you're going to do the opposite of multiplication, and we're going to actually divide by 1.8. So, for example, if I have 90 degrees Fahrenheit, and I want to know what that is in degrees Celsius, I would first subtract 32 degrees from that 90 value, and that's going to give me a 58. And then I would take the 58 and divide by 1.8 to actually get 32.2, Thus, 90 degrees Fahrenheit is equal to 32.2 degrees Celsius. So it's really not that hard to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit or Fahrenheit to Celsius. A more precise scale that was developed by Lord Kelvin is exactly named after him, the Kelvin scale. Now, this is for more precise scientific measurements. Uh, it's numbering systems in degrees above absolute zero, Kelvin scale. And all molecular motion ceases at absolute zero. Now, what is absolute zero? Absolute zero is technically the temperature at which there's no more movement of molecules. Um, once you reach absolute zero, there's no more molecular motion. And therefore, there's no more heat created. Um, so one degree intervals are the same as Celsius on this scale. Now, how would I convert Celsius to Kelvin? This is just a little example again. I would take that Celsius temperature and I would add 273 to it to get the Kelvin temperature. Pretty simple stuff. Keep in mind out of all the scales, Celsius, Fahrenheit, and Kelvin, Kelvin's values are going to be the largest. All right. Now we get to go into a little bit more in-depth on the weather part uh, as far as what controls the temperatures. We have four factors that control the temperatures that we're most interested in in the field of weather. We have latitude, land and water distribution, ocean currents, and elevation. Those are the, these are the four main factors that determine temperatures at any one point in the Earth's surface. The first thing we're going to talk about is latitude. And why is latitude important? It has to do with, first of all, the tilt of the Earth at 23 and a half degrees from the plane of the ecliptic. The Earth is tilted at a 23 and a half degree angle on its axis. All right. You also have the Sun in its relationship with the Earth. Um, what, what happens because of this tilt on its axis as the Sun revolves around the Earth throughout the season, throughout the time of year, um, what you find interesting is the most direct solar radiation is actually at the equator because the sun is much higher over the, over the horizon, it's much higher in the sky, the radiation is much more direct there. So therefore you have much warmer temperatures at the equator. The sun's rays hit the earth at a more perpendicular angle, a 90 degree angle, and this equates to more direct solar radiation over a smaller area. 
whereas the sun's rays are much more slanted or there's they're they're lower the sun is lower on the horizon at the polar areas at 90 degrees north or 90 degrees south and because of that longer lower sun angle sun much lower and closer to the horizon it has to travel through a greater distance in the atmosphere and and there's a lot of reflection um, the sun's solar radiation is much more indirect at the poles um, and and as a result you have cooler temperatures so much warmer temperatures at the equator much cooler temperatures at the poles and this again has to do with the fact of the earth-sun relationship the fact the earth is at a 23 and a half degrees tilt angle in relation to the sun what about land water distribution i find this one interesting i've lived i spent a lot of my life living along water so um, i've seen this firsthand with land water distribution this is an important thing to remember the land heats and cools five times faster than water um, if you're in the middle of a continent location, a middle of the continent, like the middle of the United States, like in Nebraska, Iowa, Chicago, I'm going to show you examples here. We'll do some comparison to the cities here in a minute. But if you're on the water, let's say you're on the east coast of the United States along the water, you know, you could be in Maryland, uh, on, in a, living in a city close to the Atlantic Ocean, and you compare the average temperatures to a place like Iowa or somewhere in the Midwest, Missouri, where there's hardly any water around there to influence temperature, you will notice a big change in the overall annual temperature range. And I'm going to show you that here in a minute. Now, land has a much lower specific heat as compared to water. So it takes less heat energy to heat land than it does water. Water is a very, de very deep substance, obviously. Um, for example, the ocean, the sun, it, once that sun's solar radiation hits the ocean surface, that's a large vertical depth that's got to be heated by the sun. And so it, t it has a modifying impact. The water will not warm nearly as quickly as if you heat the same sun on land. Uh, the main reason locations along the shoreline have moderate climates is due to this. Um, there's less diurnal or daily and annual temperature ranges. And let's go right to it. I'm going to show you a couple cities. Um, I have an image on the left, um, the average high and low temperatures for San Francisco. California, and then on the image on the right, I have the average temperature for a place that's, you know, not as impacted by water, Chicago. All right now, the red lines in this case represent really what I'm comparing. Uh, the red line indicates your average high temperatures over the course of the year, month by month, January to December. Uh, for location on uh, San Francisco, let's talk about that. San Francisco is located right there in the Pacific Ocean. And as a result, it has a smaller annual temperature range. The coldest month in San Francisco is 55 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas the warmest month is 73 degrees Fahrenheit. And that is because of the modifying impact of the nearby ocean. All right, nearby ocean. Look at the location of Chicago. Larger annual temperature range between 29 degrees in the coldest month all the way up to 83 degrees in the summertime. So you can see there's a large spread here in a location such as Chicago because they're, they're not as impacted by water. Now, they have Lake Michigan there, but that's not nearly um, a major contributing factor as compared to a large ocean uh, that San Francisco is located on. Ocean currents in general, these are very important to consider when we talk about temperature for a place, any location on Earth. Um, along the west coast of continents, especially, you know, I'm showing you an example here, the west coast of the U.S., we have cold currents that travel equatorward or southward, indicated by the blue arrow, okay? That is known uh, along the coast of California as a California current, and it has a very, um, let's say, a modifying influence on the temperature in California. The image on the right shows the east coast. That red arrow shows you a warm ocean current. And this happens to have a very special name along the East Coast. It's called the Gulf Stream Current. And the, that current is very important as far as storm development. You know, talk about wintertime, nor'easter is a special type of cyclone. And we'll get into that a little bit later in the training series throughout the summer. But they have a major impact on strengthening cyclones. The heating of that warm ocean current from below and energy conversions that go on um, really play a large role in how strong a storm system gets on these coastal storms as they go up the East Coast, um, and, and also on the temperatures. So let's examine a couple locations and compare 
the annual temperature ranges based on ocean currents. I'm comparing San Diego, California on the left image, and then I have a graph for the average temperatures for Jacksonville, Florida on the right hand image. Keep in mind, Jacksonville and San Diego are basically located at the same latitude line, 30 degrees north. And so there's really, they're the same distance from the equator. So equal latitude here, but San Diego is located uh, right there on the Southern California coast, right on the Pacific Ocean, uh, right next to that colder California current. Whereas Jacksonville, Florida is located, uh, you know, with the warm Gulf Stream right offshore. And you'll notice this annual temperature ranges again. San Diego on the left, annual temperature range from 65 degrees to 76 degrees in the warmest month. Whereas Jacksonville has a larger temperature range throughout the year, ranging from 65 all the way up to 90. Okay, so that's, that's quite a spread when you think about it. Again, these two locations, Jacksonville and San Diego, are at the same latitude, same distance from the equator. However, San Diego is located along a cooler ocean current, Jacksonville along a warmer ocean current. Therefore, you have a larger annual temperature range between these two locations. And, and, and one more final piece, contributing factor to temperature control is elevation. One thing we talked about a little bit in that first video last week was how air cools as it rises. All right, so if you were a hiker and let's say you start out at the base of this mountain range, you could be starting out with a temperature of 50 degrees Fahrenheit, no snow on the ground. But as you continue to climb up and hike this mountain, you're going to notice a significant change, a significant drop in the air temperature as you go higher and higher up the mountain. You may go from 50 degrees at the base of this mountain on this particular day and drop all the way down to below freezing at 30 degrees Fahrenheit by the time you reach the top of the mountain. And this is why it's very important if you are a hiker to make sure you pack accordingly. Uh, you might only need a light jacket at the base of the mountain. But as you go higher and higher, you could be running into snow you could be running into much colder temperatures. Um, so it's always important to pack warm weather gear, layered, layered clothing and warm weather gear as you hike up a mountain. So if I were to compare two cities based on elevation, <clears throat> I'm going to compare Quito, Ecuador. That's the, that's the graphic on the left for temperatures. The elevation of Quito, Ecuador is 9,350 feet. Um, the image on the right shows Kwajalein Atoll. I've been to Kwajalein. It's just a very small strip of land, and it's at sea level. Both of these locations are fairly close to the equator. Again, so latitude really doesn't have a big role in this. It's more of elevation has a more significant role in the temperatures here that you're seeing. The graph on the left with Quito, Ecuador, at the higher elevation above 9,000 feet, your average temperatures range between 20 and 22 degrees Celsius. Um, keep in mind that 20 degrees Celsius is about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. 22 Celsius, we're into the lower 70s, 71, 72 degrees Fahrenheit. So the temperatures don't really change a whole lot um, in Quito, Ecuador, um, but they're much cooler overall throughout the course of the year. Whereas Kwajalein, which is at sea level in the tropical area, not far from the equator, um, you know, there's no elevation there. And you see that red line, uh, the image on the right for Kwajalein, that average temperature remains above 30 degrees Celsius uh, pretty much for the majority of the year. That's, that's an average temperature warmer than 86 degrees Fahrenheit throughout the year, and they have a lot of humidity too. Um, so look at that warmer annual temperature ranges, 30 to 32 Celsius, very warm location. And you're looking at a 10 degrees Celsius difference here between Quito and Kwajalein Atoll. Uh, it's pretty significant, and it has to do with the elevation aspect of temperature control. Now, we get to move into another very exciting topic here in the training. We're going to talk about energy. Okay, Energy is what really gets things going in the atmosphere. Uh, it's the ability or capacity to do work on some form of matter. And just as a quick review, matter is something that has mass and it takes up space. Uh, work is going to be done when something is moved over a specific distance. Work literally is equal to the force exerted on an object times its distance, okay? There are two types of energy that we really need to talk about. And this is very important in the atmosphere and with the weather. We have potential energy and we have kinetic energy. With potential energy, 
This is the energy that's stored in objects. And it's a result of position or its configuration of the object. So, for example, let's say you have a brick and you you hold it, kind of, you have your arm down next to your side, next to your leg. You have a brick in your hand, okay? And if you were to drop that brick on your foot, it would hurt. Don't keep me wrong, it would hurt. But it's at a much lower position. The Its potential energy at a lower position is not as great. If you take that same brick now and you lift it higher up above your shoulder and then you drop that brick from a higher position onto your foot, it's going to hurt more. In fact, you might break a toe. Um, but that just shows you that potential energy has a lot to do with height in the atmosphere. That's what I'm getting at. So the higher you have, um, the higher height you go up in the atmosphere, the greater the potential energy available. Because we've got to think about something um, that we call gravity. And gravity is always acting downward. And uh, that kind of goes in the same direction as that potential energy, wherever the object is, if it was falling from higher towards lower uh, elevation. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. And this is anything that moves. Anything that moves has energy, has kinetic energy. Okay, And this depends on the mass and speed of an object. Uh, kinetic energy is literally equal to mass times the velocity squared of an object. Okay, We won't really get that in depth about the math here, but just real, realize mass and the speed come into play when we talk about kinetic energy, how much energy that has. Faster moving objects are going to have more kinetic energy. And that goes back to my discussion on temperature. When the molecules are moving much more quickly, they have more energy and they heat up. As a result, temperatures are warmer. Uh, water has greater kinetic energy than air. And why is this the case? Why does water have higher, have greater kinetic energy? Because of its mass. It's a much more dense substance. So let's take a look at things. Water being denser, if you were to lift up, uh, go, ahead, go and fill up a bucket of water and carry that around the house, you're, gonna, you're definitely going to know, wow, this is pretty heavy. Water is a very dense substance, and therefore it has greater kinetic energy than air. Right. So if I have a couple examples here for potential energy. I talked about the importance of elevation. Right. So which one, dam A on the left or dam B on the right, is going to have more potential energy? And again, think about this. The potential energy is, depends on the position above sea level. The higher the object, the greater the potential energy. So in this case, dam B has way more elevation. It's a higher position than dam A. And therefore, dam B is going to have a uh, greater potential energy. Uh, not only that, but it has greater mass because there's more water um, involved with uh, dam B as compared to dam A. Kinetic energy, I'm going to do an example here. Uh, we got a little truck trucking along. Okay, truck A is moving along at about 35 miles per hour. Here comes truck B. Whoa, that went quick. 100 miles per hour, truck B is speeding. So which one of these has more kinetic energy? All right, keep in mind again, kinetic energy is dependent on the mass and the velocity of an object. Um, higher the velocity or higher that speed, the more kinetic energy. So in this case, it would be truck B moving at 100 miles per hour, way more kinetic energy than truck A traveling at 35 miles per hour. Right. Now, here's another example of kinetic energy. We talked about mass and we talked about velocity. Those are the two main contributing factors in determining which has more kinetic energy. In this case, we have truck 1, which is traveling at 50 miles an hour, Truck two is also traveling at 50 miles per hour. So we have two trucks moving at the same speed or velocity. Okay. Which one has more kinetic energy? Remember, kinetic energy equals the mass times the velocity squared. So the higher the mass, the greater the kinetic energy. In this case, look how massive um, that truck is in the bottom example there. Truck two is compared to truck one. So therefore, truck two would have more kinetic energy because it's more massive. All right. Now, with energy in the atmosphere, I just wanted to mention one simple thing here. The laws of thermodynamics describe energy processes in the atmospheres. You can Google this if you want to really look more in depth on this. I'm going to keep this pretty basic and pretty simple right now. But the laws of thermodynamics, thermo means heat, and then you got, you know, dynamics, a lot of uh, energy. The energy 
uh, the, the laws of thermodynamics describe the energy processes. So let's move on. The first thing I'm going to talk about is the conservation of energy. This is very important. First law of thermodynamics. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. Okay. What happens here, and, and this happens a lot in the atmosphere, is you may have a case where you have just this excessive potential energy, and then there might be another case where there's just not much energy at all for a storm. Now, you get these really strong storms when you have the excessive potential energy. And when that potential energy, the energy of position, is converted to the energy of motion, kinetic energy, when you convert potential to kinetic energy and you have a large energy availability, that's when you're going to get really strong storms. And a lot of conversions of the energy in that storm process, in the storm motions, the vertical motions and all that. So simply changes from one state to another. Energy is not created nor destroyed. It just changes its, its, its form from one state to another. Energy lost in one process is then gained by another process. Uh, energy exchange must be equal and conserved. Okay, So that's a very important um, conservation of energy. The first law of thermodynam thermodynamics is very, very important. Now, in the atmosphere, what do we have? We have radiant energy that comes directly from our main energy source, the sun, right? And, and then we have these heat transfer methods in the atmosphere. You have this built up heat energy, it's gotta go somewhere. And, and the energy always flows from hotter substances to toward colder substances. The flow is always from hotter to colder, all right? So here are the ways the atmosphere, these are the methods the atmosphere has developed to distribute the excess the warmer heat energy, higher heat energy to a lower heat energy. Uh, radiation is the first thing, and, and that could be from both the sun, solar radiation, as well as the earth at night when the sun goes down, it's letting off that long wave earth radiation trying to cool off. So radiation involves both solar, the sun, and the earth. Conduction, we talked a little bit about this in the video, the last video I made last week. Conduction is heating by direct contact. And it's, very, it's a very shallow layer closer to the surface. Convection is a very effective method in the vertical um, for energy to be redistributed. And usually you get the, on a hot summer's day, you get rising air because the sun's shortwave energy, solar radiation hits the Earth's surface that heats the lower levels of the atmosphere. And that is, when that happens, that air is less dense, it wants to rise. And you end up getting a vertical circulation developed where you get the hotter air rising towards the upper atmosphere from hotter surface to the colder upper atmosphere and that's the direction that energy will flow always and then you have advection which is more of the horizontal uh, so think advection horizontal movement of air uh, advection uh, heat transfer processes happen a lot in the winter time when we're talking about major storm systems um, there's a there's a major transport of warmer air and Excessive heat energy on the uh, on the uh, front side of a low pressure system, a cyclone. On the back side, you have colder air and less en less energy, and more denser air on the back side of the storm, and and so advection occurs. It's another method the atmosphere uses to redistribute this energy, excess energy. All right, so let's break these down really quickly. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about is that solar radiation. Look at our cool looking sun there with the sunglasses on. Um, during the day, the sun's shortwave radiation is going to heat the Earth's surface, resulting in surface heatings. So those red arrows represent that shortwave radiation coming directly from the sun to the Earth's surface. At nighttime, the sun goes down. We have all the excess heat energy that's built up from the daytime. The sun is basically, set, or the Earth is basically trying to cool itself off. As soon as the sun goes down after sunset, the Earth starts sending out this long wave terrestrial radiation in an attempt to get rid of the excess heat accumulated during the day. And this is going to result in surface cooling uh, overnight. And then we have conduction. And I talked about the example of the boiling pot of water in the last video. But conduction is simp uh, simply heating by direct contact. Um, solar radiation heats up the Earth's surface. And then that shallow little molecular boundary layer from the surface to about one centimeter that heat is transferred just by, by direct heating, by direct contact conduction, just in a shallow little layer of air. And, and again, with all heat transfer mechanisms, 
heat always transfers from hotter objects to colder objects. Just keep that in mind. Good conductors of energy uh, are metals and silver iron. And we know that a metal pan is a very good conductor of energy because if you heat it up, it gets hot quickly. All right. And then convection. Convection is a very important process the atmosphere has created to get rid of excessive heat at the, at the lower levels of the atmosphere. It's the vertical transfer of heat from the ground to the upper atmosphere from hotter to colder um, due to a temperature gradient. Right? And there's two types of convection. There's free convection, and this is where the surface warms by that direct heating, the conduction, uh, direct contact. Uh, warm air is going to rise and cool air is going to sink. Warm air is less dense and cooler air is much more dense. So therefore, warm air rises, cold air sinks. And then there's force convection. Now, force convection is when air is forced aloft mechanically. When I say mechanically, um, for example, this blue arrow in this image is showing you the wind blowing up against this mountain slope. Well, since the mountain slope is a solid object, the wind can't blow right through it. So the air is forced to rise mechanically. Force convection over the top of this mountain uh, as air rises, it cools, and typically what happens, you get clouds to form on the windward side of these mountains, right? So fronts is another example of force convection. When air, air flows into a front or basically intersects a frontal surface, it's forced to rise mechanically as well. Uh, force convection occurs in that case. All right, here's an example of the last heat transfer mechanism known as temperature advection. This blue little oval coming down, that represents colder air advection, okay? When I say advection, all I'm saying is a um, horizontal movement of air, a mixing of air masses, temperature advection, okay? Colder air usually is uh, working its way towards the equator. Warmer air is usually working its way towards the polar areas northward. And as a result, guess what? You have a change in air masses. You could uh, Weather fronts to form as a result of this temperature advection, this horizontal movement of the air masses. Uh, and this, this happens a lot in the winter season. That's why I'm really, uh, I put this, I added that in there, winter season. Okay. All right. And then we're going to talk about the Earth-Sun relationship. All right. This is very important we talk about this. Earth has two basic motions. It has a rotation motion every 24 hours. And that rotation is what causes our night and our day. Uh, it's generally a west to east spin, and it does affect wind direction. Now, we haven't really talked about the global wind circulations. Uh, that's the three-cell theory. Um, but keep in mind that the global winds, the overall predominant global winds, uh, a lot of that is attributed to the fact that the Earth is rotating. And that second basic motion of the Earth is revolution, or orbit about the sun. 365 and a quarter days. Uh, that's basically one complete revolution. And it's slightly elliptical, the revolution, and it's the cause of our seasons, along with that tilt of the axis I mentioned, tilt on the axis of the Earth at 23.5 degrees. And it impacts the amount of incoming solar radiation. So, what is the whole implication with all this? This results in our seasons. And in the northern hemisphere, again, the seasons are caused due to the Earth's tilted axis. Um, solstices are, you know, we're going to go over those first. What does solstice mean? Literally, if you were to take the meaning of it, it means sun to stand. And the summer solstice is on the 22nd of June every year, right around that time period. And this is the time when the sun is directly overhead at 23.5 degrees north latitude. And that specific latitude line is known as the Tropic of Cancer. Uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, we have our longest day and our shortest night on the summer solstice. Um, aphelion occurs around the 4th of July. And what is aphelion? That basically is the point at which the sun is farthest from the Earth. Okay? At aphelion. Um, now, our summer solstice in June is the exact opposite season in the Southern Hemisphere. It's actually wintertime in the Southern Hemisphere. The winter solstice occurs in late December, around the 21st, 22nd of December. And this is when the sun is most directly overhead at 23.5 degrees south latitude. That specific latitude line is known as a Tropic of Capricorn. Um, in the northern hemisphere, we have our shortest days and our longest nights. And surprisingly, you look at perihelion occurring around 3 January. 
And this is when the Earth is closest to the sun. So now you ask yourself, and it's a good question I get, if the Earth is closest to the sun in early January, then why are we not warmer? Why are our temperatures so cold? Again, it has to do with the position of the sun in the sky. The sun is much closer to the horizon. It's much lower in the sky. The sun's rays are much more slanted. And so a lot of that solar radiation gets reflected or absorbed by air molecules. A lot of it doesn't even make it down to the Earth's surface in the wintertime. So due to those factors, um, even though we are closest to the sun in early January, we still have our coldest temperatures. Um, the angle of incidence is the angle at which the sun's rays, the solar rays, strike the Earth's surface. And the angle of incidence um, being more um, lower sun angles is the main reason we are still cold. Um, in the southern hemisphere, that winter solstice around the 22nd of December, that in the southern hemisphere is their summertime. Right, and then we have the equinoxes. Now, equinox literally means equal day or night, okay? The autumnal equinox is our first day of fall, and it typically occurs around 23rd of September in the northern hemisphere is our first day of fall here. It's the first day of spring in the southern hemisphere. The sun is directly overhead at the equator, and day and night are equal everywhere on the Earth. There's 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of night everywhere on the Earth's surface, no matter what latitude you go to on the equinox. Now, the vernal equinox, or the spring equinox, this is the first day of spring. It's around the 21st of March, and the sun is directly overhead at the equator again. And, and in day and night are equal again everywhere on the Earth. There's 12 hours a day and 12 hours a night everywhere. Now, on the 21st of March, that's the first day of spring in the northern hemisphere, but it's the first day of fall in the southern hemisphere. All right, so in tonight's training video, what do we take a look at tonight? We took a look at temperature and energy. Um, we looked at temperature scales. So there's three temperature scales that we're most interested in in the field of meteorology. Uh, we're looking at the Fahrenheit temperature scale. We use that most commonly at the Earth's surface here in the United States. We're used to our temperatures being in degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, degrees Celsius is used in Europe and a lot of the other countries around the world. Um, so Fahrenheit, Celsius, and also Kelvin. Kelvin temperature scale is a much more precise scale for um, more, uh, it's more accurate as far as uh, precision for scientific measurements. Controls of temperature, the four of those. We have latitude, land and water distribution, ocean currents, and elevation. So just keep that in mind. Um, that really is, are the determining factors for what kind of temperature you see at a specific location on the Earth's surface. Um, how far north or south of the equator is a city? Um, how, how do cities compare with each other? One along the coast, along a water, a large water body like an ocean, or one that's in the interior of a continent? It's going to be a big difference in the annual temperature ranges, as we showed. And then ocean currents. You have colder ocean currents on the west coast of continents, warmer ocean currents on the east coast of continents, um, and that plays a big role in the weather, especially for locations like Southern California. You would think based on latitude that they would be much warmer, but they're not. As that wind blows from west to east in the middle latitudes, that wind blows over that cooler California current. And then you've got elevation. How high above sea level is a location? Uh, air cools with height in the atmosphere, and uh, so therefore we looked at Quito, Ecuador, over 9,000 foot elevation much cooler annual temperatures as compared to a location at sea level, such as Kwajalein. And then energy. Energy is the ability and capacity to do work. And there were two types of energy that are very important in the atmosphere. That would be potential, which is based on position, and then kinetic energy, which is based on motion. Heat transfer mechanisms in the uh, atmosphere include radiation. And radiation... Um, occurs in the form of electromagnetic waves. And there's two types of radiation. You can get solar radiation from the sun during the day and then earth radiation at night, the long wave earth radiation as earth tries to cool off. And then conduction is heating by direct contact. Very shallow layer near the earth's surface is impacted by conduction. And then you have convection, which is much more effective in transporting heat energy from the surface to higher up in the atmosphere in the vertical. And there's two types of convection. There was free convection, and there's also forced convection. 
And then advection, which is the horizontal transport of colder or warmer air or excess energy. Um, energy flows from, from a higher state to a lower state. Earth-Sun relationship uh, it plays a significant role in um, the seasons are a result of the Earth's tilted axis along with the Earth-Sun relationship. And the sun angle impacts how hot or cold a region gets. Um, if it's a more direct sun, uh, sun angle, the sun's higher in the sky, it's going to be much warmer, such as locations near the equator. And it's going to be much colder at the polar areas because the um, sun is much lower on the horizon, longer solar rays passing through the atmosphere, and therefore you have colder temperatures at the surface. All right, that wraps things up. Video number two of the summer video weather training series. I am so excited. I'm so glad you're watching this. I really hope um, you enjoy learning about the atmosphere as we progress throughout the summer here at Spot on Weather. Um, again, feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spot on Weather YouTube channel. Uh, look us up in uh, Facebook. We're in uh, Twitter. Again, I do updates regularly for forecasts during the week. That wraps things up. I hope everybody has a sensational day. I hope you're having a great day wherever you are, wherever you're watching from. Take care. Uh, we'll continue the video training series again soon. Uh, until then, take care, and I uh, hope you enjoy the presentation. Have a good evening, everybody.